Νομίζω ότι δεν θα υπήρχε καταλληλότερη έτσι πάσα όσον αφορά την τελευταία ε, έκκληση που έκανε ο κύριος Σεμπά για το συνδυασμό της επιστημονικής γνώσης με την έννοια των ιατρικών ε, δεδομένων με την ε, πρακτική των εισαγγελικών και δικαστικών αρχών από το να δώσουμε το λόγο στην κυρία Σαμάνθα Τόμσον η οποία παρατηρώ ότι το πρώτο της πτυχίο είναι βιολογίας πριν γίνει συνάδελφος στην νομική επιστήμη άρα έχει όλα τα φόντα να μας πει πώς, ε, και πρέπει να πω εδώ ότι ε, είναι πολλές φορές για μας ε, που είμαστε μια άλλη σχολή ε, και όσον αφορά τη συγκρότηση της δικαιοσύνης είναι αξιοθαύμαστη η ευελιξία που υπάρχει στον αγγλοσαξονικό κόσμο όσον αφορά το ποιοι στελεχώνουν τις δικαστικές και εισαγγελικές υπηρεσίες και πώς αξιοποιείται έτσι με πολύ μεγαλύτερη ευελιξία ε, το επιστημονικό προσωπικό στις χώρες αυτές λοιπόν να πω ότι η κυρία Τόμψον ασχολείται ιδιαίτερος ως ε, ε, στέλεχος του Crown Prosecutor's Office ε, στο, ε, στη, όσον αφορά τα ζητήματα στη διεύθυνση στρατηγικού σχεδιασμού της εισαγγελίας των Αύγουστος του 2011 και τη ζητήθηκε να, να αναλάβει το σχεδιασμό της πολιτικής για τη σεξουαλική μετάδοση της λίμωξης HIV όπου έχει εμπλακεί ενεργά στην ε, ανάπτυξη αυτής της στρατηγικής και στην ε, αναθεώρηση της όπου χρειάζεται και ε, προσπαθεί ε, να διασφαλίσει ότι αυτό το είδος οι οδηγίες που εμείς τόσο πολύ δυσκολευόμαστε να δώσουμε στους εισαγγελείς στην Ελλάδα εκεί πέρα θα εφαρμόζονται. Έχετε το λόγο. Thank you. I think the plan is, before I speak, to play a short video, um, which was um, something which was produced in conjunction a colleague of mine from the Crown Prosecution Service and um, a couple of um, uh, non-governmental organisations, charitable organisations, the Terence Higgins Trust and the National AIDS Trust, who uh, we all work together to um, try and produce uh, an informative video, uh, which we hope will um, assist um, uh, those countries who are developing their policy on HIV and, and prosecution um, in terms of the things that, that we look at. So I think the plan is to play that first. Although most countries can and do prosecute potential exposure to the risk of HIV transmission, in England and Wales only actual transmission is prosecutable. The law used is the Offences Against the Person Act of 1861 and the charge is either reckless or intentional grievous bodily harm. Since intent is very difficult to prove, prosecutions have been for reckless HIV transmission. Recklessness is defined in English law as the conscious taking of an unjustifiable risk. In October 2003, Mohamed Dika became the first person to be successfully prosecuted for recklessly transmitting HIV, taking everyone by surprise, including Lisa Power, Policy Director at Terence Higgins Trust, or THT. THT was the first UK organisation to be set up in response to HIV, and is now the leading and largest sexual health charity in the UK. So let's start by talking about what it was like before the, the first prosecution in October 2003. How unexpected was that first prosecution? We'd had a prosecution in Scotland uh, and we were aware that they could happen but we We'd had previous cases in England where it hadn't gone to court, so I think we were um, unnecessarily tranquil about the whole thing, and the Dika case just kind of exploded on us. Uh, we didn't see it coming until it was already in court. So it was quite panicking in some ways. It was just an ingenious barrister who decided that they could use this law and that they would try and use this. It was really experimental. It was, it was somebody who decided that they wanted to do Mr. Dika and they found a law on which they could try it on, essentially. Mr. Dika was eventually tried and retried a total of four times. 
During this 18-month period, there was a great deal of confusion over what was actually against the law and how people with HIV could protect themselves from prosecution. The second case led to even more uncertainty. A man who had not actually been diagnosed HIV positive at the time of the alleged transmission pleaded guilty to recklessly inflicting grievous bodily harm. Could undiagnosed people now be criminally liable too? A third case, Kanzani, which reached the Court of Appeal in March 2005, clarified that a person who knows their HIV positive status and does not disclose this prior to sex that carries a risk of transmission would potentially be liable to prosecution if transmission occurs. Unfortunately, the media covered these and later cases with inaccurate and stigmatizing headlines. And the publicity meant that more people began making complaints, including people who weren't actually infected. It was incredibly messy to start with, and we all know the cases that got to court and what was actually finally prosecuted. But we were seeing, after the first reports of the Dika case and then the others got into the press, we were seeing all kinds of people suddenly being accused. Um, the police were making it up as they went along. Um, and the Crown Prosecution Service were trying to catch up with what was going on. Uh, and it was chaos out there, and that, of course, translated into an awful lot of very worried people with HIV. So at what point did it become clear that the way forward was uh, prosecutorial guidance? Well, we, we wrote to the Crown Prosecution Service asking them to meet with us because it was chaos, um, but we didn't get a response. We wrote to them twice and didn't get anything out of them. And then Youssef from NAT had the bright idea of writing to the Commission for Racial Equality. Um, and copying them in. And of course that threat brought them around the table very fast indeed. So God bless Yusuf, he found the key to make them pay attention to what we were trying to do. Yusuf Azad is the Director of Policy and Campaigns at NAT, formerly the National AIDS Trust. NAT is the UK's leading HIV policy organisation. In July 2004, Yusuf and Lisa brought together many stakeholders within the HIV sector to discuss tactics, which is where the idea emerged that they had to engage with the Crown Prosecution Service. We weren't getting anywhere, and so that's where I said, OK, let's cut to the chase. We wrote let a letter from the chief execs of NAT and THT to the director of public prosecutions, the man in charge, but we copied in the chair of the Commission for Racial Equality. There is an obligation on a public body in law in the UK, and that includes the Crown Prosecution Service, to work in a way that promotes equality and eliminates discrimination. We pointed out that the first three prosecutions were of African migrants, so there's a race equality dimension to what they were doing. There could be, going forward, if gay men were prosecuted, a sexual orientation equality dimension. And because people with HIV are disabled, deemed to be disabled in our legal system, there was a disability equality dimension. So the fact that the first three people accused and prosecuted were African was something that we responded to by reminding the public authorities of their equality duty and their equality obligations. And that letter broke through the silence and the obfuscation and within a couple of weeks the process of developing prosecution guidance had begun. And within the HIV sector was there consensus that that was the way forward rather than say attempt for law reform or, or any other uh, way? There were a lot of different opinions, but the majority of people in the sector didn't want the law involved at all. They didn't want anything to be against the law. Um, and Youssef and I kind of stood out. Our agencies were very clear that you couldn't have nothing ever being an offence, that that just wasn't going to wash. We knew that changing the law was unlikely to happen, and even if it did happen, there was it wasn't even that there was no guarantee it would go our way, it was highly likely not to go our way. We could have actually ended up with a specific penalty for HIV transmission that was even more draconian. Until we could get law reform and get a very big change in public opinion, what we needed to do was actually to mitigate the harm being done. Working together on prosecutorial policy and guidance is a pragmatic way of doing HIV justice. It means applying criminal laws to people with HIV more fairly and consistently 
in a restrained, proportionate and appropriate way, in a way that serves justice without jeopardising public health objectives and fundamental human rights. everyone um, found that video informative. I've not seen that version of the video myself, so it was interesting for me to uh, watch it along with you. Um, I am going to now move on to, to my presentation, um, but I would like to first um, offer my thanks to um, those of you who've been involved in organising this event uh, for inviting me and inviting me on behalf of the Crown Prosecution Service to attend and speak about our policy. Um, it's, um, I think it's very important that as you move forward with your discussions in relation to the incidents that are happening in, in Athens and also in, in, in Greece as a whole, uh, that there is a dialogue that takes place between uh, everyone who has an interest in this field. And we, as an agency, found it um, informative and useful engaging with the Terence Higgins Trust and the National AIDS Trust in our discussions and in the development of our approach to prosecutions in England and Wales. Without the involvement of those agencies, we wouldn't be where we are today with our policy on prosecution, and we wouldn't be taking part in discussions uh, with UNAIDS as to the development of further policy in this field in an international arena. So I think some basics probably help. Um, what is the CPS, known as the Crown Prosecution Service, that's how we're often referred to. We um, are the individuals who prosecute individuals in England and Wales who are alleged to have committed a criminal offence. We employ administrative staff, uh, lawyers and paralegal staff to prepare and present the criminal cases at court. Our lawyers are also advocates and they attend court and they present cases in-house for the CPS. We work in the Magistrates Court and in the Crown Court and we also appear in the Court of Appeal. Um, we work alongside the police and the court service, the probation service and the youth justice service. When we decide to prosecute in a criminal case, there are a number of um, processes that take place before that decision is made. The role of the police in that is to investigate an alleged crime, to gather the evidence, uh, make an arrest, interview the suspect, and um, uh, then bring the papers or bring the case to the Crown Prosecutor who will make the ultimate decision on prosecution. In respect of uh, cases involving transmission of infection, um, there are some guidelines which have been issued to the police, uh, the ACPO guidelines. That stands for Association of Chief Police Officers. And in, um, in the UK, police forces are divided up ge geographically, and each police force will have its own chief of police. And those individuals are members of an organisation called ACPO, which sets out principles and guidelines for its officers to follow. And those um, guidelines have been very crucial to the application of uh, police uh, investigative techniques in relation to STI cases. The role of the prosecutor then is to decide if there's enough evidence, whether the defendant committed the crime or not, and where appropriate advise the police if further evidence is needed. And in uh, cases involving transmission of infection, we believe that it's crucial that there is an early dialogue between the police and the Crown Prosecutor as to the evidence in the case, and that only that dialogue, dialogue will assist in the prosecution of, of, uh, of an offender. Um, all cases that we prosecute are assessed against evidential and public interest tests which are set out in a code called the Code of Crown Prosecutors which all prosecutors in England and Wales must follow. The evidential test is what it says. It's a test of whether there is sufficient evidence for the case to be uh, brought to court. The public interest test is a more complicated uh, um, public-facing test, and that, that really is, is the one perhaps where some of the, the more difficult decisions uh, would be made in cases, decisions whether to prosecute in STI cases. So you've heard something of this already in the video. 
um, the consequences uh, of an infection can be serious. And in the case of DICA, the court decided that, in fact, transmission of HIV equated to uh, a grievous bodily harm under the Offences Against the Person Act. The two offences, as you heard on the video, are intentional transmission under Section 18 of that Act and reckless transmission under Section 20. As you also heard in that uh, uh, video, there had been no prosecutions for intentional transmission. It's rarely used because we have to prove a deliberate infliction of infection. That requires both scientific, medical and factual evidence which proves the defendant intentionally and actually transmitted the infection to the complainant. If someone was charged with intentional transmission, the consent of the other individual would not be a defence. We could prosecute for attempt if we could prove that they intended to sexually transmit the infection but failed to do so. But this is where the uh, CPS in England and Wales has, uh, I think, focused its attention in terms of the prosecutions that have gone on so far. We've looked at um, the issue of recklessness and I think, you, again, you heard something about that in the video. The question for us under this particular piece of legislation is whether the defend defendant foresaw that the complainant might contract the infection but went on to take the risk anyway. So the defendant or the person A knows they're infectious, decides to not tell the other person and, and um, uh, that person is unaware. <laughs> that person is unaware that there is a risk. The level of risk of transmission is relevant and Patrick spoke about this. Um, depends on the number of exposures, the nature and status of the infection, so treatments, the fact that someone may have a very low viral load will all be relevant information in making a decision about this. We would look at the reasonableness of taking the risk. What, what is the individual doing? What, what's their action reasonable in all the circumstances? If they were following a plan of health care and they were taking uh, precautions, then their actions may be reasonable and it may be inappropriate uh, to prosecute them because we couldn't prove that they were reckless. So we look at the scientific, medical and factual evidence of that. And in that case, uh, informed consent is a defence. So if someone has told their partner and their partner takes the risk, then there is no offence to be prosecuted. <coughs> cannot prosecute for attempt. I think Patrick touched on this. Um, prosecutions in England and Wales do not cover transmission. We only prosecute where there has actually been transmission and we can prove that there has been transmission. So just some background on the development of our policy. As you saw from the video, the first case that was prosecuted, 2003, so not that long ago, um, but created quite a debate in the UK as to whether that was appropriate uh, and what we should be looking at when we think about prosecuting these cases. It was necessary to think about the balance between the public health considerations and the criminal justice considerations of indi individuals who felt wronged or betrayed by uh, a partner who had infected them with HIV. We took the view that whilst we were discussing um, the uh, issue in relation to HIV, that the policy that we developed wasn't specifically limited to HIV. Our policy covers all transmission of infection, sexual transmission of infection. So it would cover other conditions such as hepatitis or herpes or other uh, sexually transmitted uh, uh, infections. But the prosecutions which were taking place at that time were all for HIV. So we consulted with the Terence Higgins Trust, with the National AIDS Trust, African HIV Policy Network and others, and um, we discussed at length the issues and concerns of those groups in relation to the criminalisation of uh, HIV. We took on board the recommendations of the Expert Advisory Group on AIDS, EAGA, in November 2006, and the National AIDS Map and the National AIDS Trust Papers in 2007. So our first uh, policy public policy was published in March of 2008. So you can see there a five-year period from the first prosecution to the actual policy being uh, presented. And during that five-year period, there was debate with all of those agencies. The latest revision to our policy was made just last year, in 2011, and we're currently reviewing our policy again, and we expect a further draft or further version of the policy will probably be published in 2013. 
So you can see just in that short space of time that we have gone through a period of consultation and debate and discussion and we've developed a policy but that policy has changed, it's changed again and it will probably change again. And that's right because the landscape changes, the medical landscape changes, the scientific evidence changes and we learn from each case that we prosecute as well and that's important. So the key features of our policy then, unlikely to prosecute for one-off sexual encounters. So the nightclub uh, incident where people meet, there's one occasion of sexual activity, um, it's unlikely to result in a prosecution um, because just because the evidence is going to be in incredibly difficult to prove that there was a, 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 um, a transmission in those circumstances. We noted that we had to take account of the fact that scientific evidence is a part of the process, but it's not conclusive proof. We need the factual evidence from the witnesses in the case, the victim, the, the suspect, both have to be weighed up against each other, so it's important not to forget that when you're thinking about the scientific uh, side of it. It's important to recognise that the defendant must know that they're infected. And again, I think several speakers have, have, have uh, mentioned this today. Patrick mentioned it um, uh, earlier on. That if someone doesn't know that they're infectious, then how can you prosecute them for transmitting something? Um, if they don't understand and they don't know how the infection is transmitted, then how can they be held accountable? In, you, in the uh, law for England and Wales, it's a question of reasonableness. If someone doesn't know and hasn't had it explained to them, how is it unreasonable of them to then be acting in that way? And in this case, as I said again, informed consent. So if a complainant or a victim is, is a party to the decision to have sex and a, a, an infection is transmitted, then that is a defence. Again, the use of safeguards, Patrick's touched on this, several people have touched on this today. If someone is following advice, if someone is taking precautions, if someone is using safeguards and is doing so in a reasonable way, it's very unlikely that we'd be able to prove recklessness. The guidance that came out in 2008 um, had a mixed reaction, um, despite the fact that we'd had engaged with several stakeholders and organisations. These are just some of the headlines that um, uh, individuals, comments that people made. Um, so Deborah Jack at the time was the chief executive of the National AIDS Trust and uh, uh, welcomed the guidelines, but you can see some of the others were less happy with the guidelines because they felt that the guidelines perhaps didn't go far enough in explaining what we needed to explain to our prosecutors. When looking at our guidance, there are a number of general principles that all of our lawyers must, must apply and consider when they're looking at a case. Um, these are set out here, quite obvious really, but sexual transmission may, may be between a man and a woman, two men, two women. It may pass from either party. It doesn't have to be the passive person or the active person. It can move in either direction. Infections in the way that they're transmitted vary. So because our guidance deals with not just HIV, it talks, it, it, it's there for guidance for any other infection. There may be some infections which are not passed uh, in, through fluid transmission. Uh, there may be contact offences such as herpes. Um, so those issues have to be considered and the way in which the infection is transmitted relates to the behaviour in the, in the individual and whether the behaviour was reasonable. Again, scientific and medical evidence is important but it's only part of the case. There must be a factual basis for bringing the case and we recognise that going through the process of a trial when a victim and a witness has to come to court and testify about their intimate sexual behaviour can be a very traumatic experience and we needed to put something in our guidance to assist our prosecutors when looking at those issues. And very importantly, one last thing, is that we have within the Crown Prosecution Service our own what we call quality assurance of decisions. We have specialist lawyers who are dealing with these cases and we have all decisions to prosecute going through one individual and that's the principal legal advisor who works directly with the director of public prosecutions who is the head of the Crown Prosecution Service. So every decision that a specialist lawyer makes will go through the principal legal advisor for sanction before the final decision is communicated. So that we think it provides a level of parity and quality assurance and it means that we're not running the risk of targeting vulnerable or particular groups of individuals. We're looking at it with a broad view under the criminal law in, in a comparable way. <laughs>
we've touched on this, some of this, um, in Patrick's presentation, I think. Um, but for our prosecutors, cases are difficult to prove because the symptoms may be clear, but the nature of the harm isn't. We've got to be satisfied that the complainant wasn't infected by someone else, so we have to think about how we prove that in the context of a criminal trial. We need to prove that the defendant knew that they were infected, um, so those who choose not to be tested could still be prosecuted if there is medical evidence or evidence from someone else that they knew they were uh, infected. Um, where there's evidence that a defendant followed medical advice, as I've said, and took appropriate safeguards, it's unlikely that we would prosecute. The scientific evidence, this is a, a field which is ever-changing, and the fundamental issues that we have here are that we must get medical evidence from experts. We must get someone who is qualified in phylogenetic analysis, in how the disease, how the infection can be passed, um, what uh, are the um, issues in relation to the treatment plan, what is the likely um, uh, rate of infection, the risk of infection, all of those things have to be covered and we as prosecutors are not qualified to make that judgment call. We have to rely on professionals, we have to rely on the medical profession, we rely on the treatment uh, 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 givers and providers to provide us with that information. We need that scientific evidence Sometimes to the, it's to the benefit of the potential suspects that we get that evidence. We, we may have a case where a victim comes forward saying, I was infected by my ex-partner, person A, and then we, when we get the medical evidence, can prove that that person couldn't have passed that infection on because they don't have the same strain of HIV, or in fact they're not infected. So that's, that's very important from our point of view. We can't prove from the scientific evidence that person A did infect person B. All we can show is that the two people have the same infection, the same strain of infection, and that's, that's the limit of what we can prove. <coughs> oh, stuck. So what else do we need in relation to prosecutor case? We need factual evidence, um, looking at the sexual history of the uh, victim, or the complainant as we call them, um, establishing the source of infection. That may mean testing their previous partners. <coughs> It may mean testing um, other people with whom they've had contact. Um, it, may, it may involve the victim having to disclose their status to previous partners with whom they've had relationships in order for that testing to take place. And sometimes complainants or victims are not prepared to do that. And if that's the case, then we, wouldn't, we can't prosecute a case. So we'd also need to know what the victim's knowledge of the defendant's status is. And this may be, for example, where a victim comes forward and says, yes, I know that my ex-partner infected me with this condition, um, but a witness, one of their friends or someone they know, says, well, actually, they knew because they, they told me that that person was infectious. So they had an awareness beforehand and decided to take the risk. So again, the factual evidence is very important. It isn't always as simple as it seems. Where we've got strong factual evidence, and we've got a defendant who refuses to supply a blood sample um, to access their medical records, and there may still be a charge, and ultimately it may be necessary to invoke a court proceedings in order to obtain that medical evidence. It doesn't mean it would be a successful prosecution. Looking at um, complainants and the witnesses that we would call in cases, I said that we had to, to think about the guidance we needed to give our prosecutors in relation to those individuals. And the fundamental principles here are that people who make complaints are likely to have to come to court and give evidence about it. It's unlikely that they will be able to just make a complaint and the person will admit the offence and that's the end of it. The complex nature of these cases means that we have to get the scientific evidence, the factual evidence, and we have to put the package together. Um, it's not likely that you're going to get many individuals in this climate, in this context, admitting straight off that, oh yes, I was the person that infected. Not least because the legal profession, the, the defence lawyers who act for these individuals, are well, well know this, this situation, and they're aware of the, the complexities and the difficulties in prosecuting cases. So where you may have an individual who thinks that they may have been responsible for, for committing the offence of infecting uh, their partner, in actual fact the scientific evidence may prove that they didn't. So what the person thinks they did and what they actually did may not be the same. Um, 
the process of going to court involves a detailed examination, as I've said, of the victim's sexual behaviour. That's very intrusive, um, and it can mean, to some extent, it being aired in public. Courts are public in, the, uh, in England and Wales, and um, it's not that easy to persuade a judge to restrict the court hearing and restrict the reporting of the case. It's possible, but it's not that easy, and we can't, as prosecutors, guarantee that that will happen. Complainants may be vulnerable. They, they're probably going through their own process of coming to terms with the fact that they're infected. They may not wish to be identified. Um, they may decide halfway through that they no longer wish to give evidence, and that is not uncommon in, in the England and Wales experience. We would look at whether or not we would still proceed without them, but I think in the vast majority of cases that would be incredibly difficult to do. We may force them to come and give evidence, and again, that's a difficult process to go down, but again, it's something that we might do if the case was important or in the public interest. And where we make a decision where we decide not to bring a case, we tell the victim uh, that that's what we're going to do, and we explain why we've done it. I said um, uh, earlier on that there was, I think, something very important about talking to um, our partners and our stakeholders and I think that's the one message probably that I will take away from today's discussions that having a healthy debate that talking with people that shaking hands with strangers and having that dialogue is a very important thing and we um, are still going on with that process uh, now we had a case this year that where a prosecution was brought for transmission of herpes it was a very particular set of circumstances and very particular set of facts. And the individual who contracted the herpes ended up with some very complicated um, uh, uh, complications, medical complications, as a result of contracting the, the, um, the virus. We've had to, to, to look at our policy and think about whether we've got the right amount of information in there for our prosecutors about this. And we don't think we have. So we've been in discussion with Terence Higgins Trust, National AIDS Trust, the Herpes Virus Association, and an organisation called the British Association for Health, Sexual Health and HIV, BASH, who are um, a, a body of medical professionals who are involved in the treatment of herpes um, and uh, other conditions such as hepatitis and HIV. So they have the experience of the medical profession to bring to the table. And we've been in discussions with them over the past few months about changes to our policy. And we don't always agree. In fact, we come at it from very different sides. Their concerns are very much along the lines of if you start to put something in your policy about herpes, there will be lots of prosecutions for herpes because people will know about it. The difficulty we have is that people are already making complaints about being infected with herpes. We have to address that issue in that context and we have to approach our discussions with the police and our prosecutors have to have some basis on which they, they, they liaise with the police in these cases. So we're looking at a new policy now, we've had the initial consultations, the principles that I've set out today of the existing policy will remain, so the issue of recklessness, the issue of reasonableness will remain, the issues of gaining scientific evidence, putting that together with the factual evidence and making sure you've got a, a case which is sufficient to put before a jury will remain. But we may uh, reassess how we deal with pr prosecuting it under the existing criminal law. What we're looking at doing is seeing whether there is any scope um, to prosecute for offences which are less serious than serious harm or GBH as it's known and prosecuting for other offences under the 1861 Act um, as to whether or not we can prosecute for, for what's called assault occasioning actual bodily harm which is where you have an offence of assault but is less serious than G uh, grievous bodily harm. The important feature or the important point I want to make about that without going into the, the complexities of the discussions is that what we're doing with that development, there's no intention to promote or increase the prosecution of any condition, of any infection that's transmitted. We're not, we're not looking to do that. What we need to do as prosecutors is increase the awareness of those cases and enable our prosecutors to have the right information so that they can make the right policy decisions looking at the evidence and looking at the public interest test that they have to apply. So the features of the revised policy that we'd be looking at would probably highlight in that policy 
that some sexually transmitted infections, for example, herpex, herpes simplex, are not necessarily so really serious as to amount to grievous bodily harm. Within that, we, we're also having to, ourselves, take account of the developments in the treatment of HIV and the fact that there is a debate in the UK, as there is elsewhere, as to whether or not HIV can now be de described as serious harm because the nature of uh, the treatments and the nature of the prognosis is, is different to how it was perhaps when we first developed this policy in 2008. So we're looking at that. We're looking at advising our prosecutors to, to look at the degree of harm by reference to the expert medical evidence which we've asked them to get and to carefully consider the appropriate level of charge and by reference to something that we call the, the offences against the person charging standard. And that is a guidance to our prosecutors which sets out when something is serious, when something is not so serious and when something is minor. The, we reflect in our policy the conflicting case law and the contention that where someone creates a danger and exposes another to a risk, um, then there is an evidential basis for an, an offence. And that, finally, that, that, that we stress the importance of the public interest test where the level of assault is minor. And the public interest test is, is I think, the more complicated area, as I've said, uh, of all of the things perhaps that prosecutors have to consider. There are conclusions that we drew from looking at our policy and looking at the conversations that we've had with agencies about it. Every case must be considered on its own merits. Many of these cases are incredibly fact-specific. I think the Honourable Mr Kirby spoke earlier on about the case of Reed um, and said that that was you know, particularly on its facts. Most of the cases that we've prosecuted are on their facts. Um, the case of Reed in, in England and Wales would have been prosecuted under our policy as, as a case of recklessness, and we would have probably concluded that his actions were unreasonable in all the circumstances. And that would have gone to court and would have been in front of a jury, and it may well that a jury in England would have made the same decision. Um, so we, we take each case on its, on its own facts, that prosecutors have to take a reasonable and practical view of the facts and they must think about what the process will involve for the victims in, involved in the case. They have to, to refer and defer to the expert scientific evidence that um, is involved and they must carefully consider this public interest. Is it in the public interest to prosecute this case? And that is the, the fundamental question. To ensure the consistency that we have in decision making, as I've said, the cases must go through this quality assurance uh, and the, the principal legal advisor's view. And we think that this enables us to be mindful of any indications that there are disproportionate effects or impacts on particular groups or individuals. And so that you're aware that um, perhaps give you some context for what I've just said, we've had 18 HIV prosecutions in England and Wales since 2003. So that's in just about, not quite 10 years, so nine years we've had 18 prosecutions. 14 of those um, happened to, they ended up in conviction, so four cases the person was not convicted. Um, we think that's a small number in comparison to other offences that we prosecute in, in England and Wales. It's a very small number. All of the prosecutions, as I've said, have been under Section 20, which is reckless transmission. Um, and this is despite the fact that our policy covers all sexually transmitted infections. We've had one case of a prosecution of hepatitis B, and we've had one case of herpes transmission, the case that took place uh, earlier this year. And as I've stated, that there are different evidential considerations for each of the infections involved, and that's possibly why it's been uh, uh, probably something that's happened in terms of predominance on HIV infection rather than um, other infections. As we develop our policy and as we learn from every case that we prosecute, um, we seek to evolve our guidance and we seek to, to change and amend our approach to these cases. The law stays the same to, to a large extent and we're acting, on, as you can see, within the, the restrictions of a law which was developed in the 1800s. Um, but what we've done is develop policy which sits alongside the law and allows our prosecutors to understand the principles that they need to consider when they're thinking about prosecuting an offence. And we think that that and the discussions that we have with the agencies that are involved in that policy uh, have been important in probably limiting the number of prosecutions that we've had in England and Wales. That wasn't the intention of the policy. We didn't set out with an intention to limit or to, in, to promote. The role of the prosecution is not to do that. The role of the prosecution is to act in terms of, of someone who makes a complaint and act on that and bring the criminal law to, 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 to bear on that. 
But what we do recognise is that as prosecutors we have a duty to the wider public, we have a duty to public health considerations, we have a duty to those that work in the medical profession, we have a duty not to um, uh, unjustifiably uh, promote, if you like, the criminalisation of, of HIV, because we, we acknowledge that those issues can um, uh, deter people from coming forward. So, so I think what we've tried to do is, is have, uh, develop a, a process where there's a balance. There's a balance between bringing the criminal law into the process, uh, but also an acknowledgement that there are public, interest, public health considerations and public interest considerations which counterbalance the, the um, extent to which someone should be prosecuted. And I think, unless there are any questions, that's all there is from me. Personally, thank, thank you very much. Vous voulez venir Λοιπόν, νομίζω ότι υπάρχει λίγος χρόνος για συζήτηση, όχι πάρα πολύ. Εάν υπάρχει κάποια ερώτηση, είμαστε όλοι πολύ πιο, πιο πλούσιοι μετά από αυτές τις δύο παρεμβάσεις. Το μόνο που θέλω να πω εγώ είναι ότι αυτό που μου ήρθε στο μυαλό όταν συνέβησαν αυτά που συνέβησαν στην Ελλάδα ήταν το μυθιστόρημα του, Καμ... του Αλμπέρ Καμί Λαπέστη Πανούκλα. Ε, αυτό είναι κάτι το οποίο έτσι, με προβλημάτισε πάρα πολύ πως το 2012 ε, ξαφνικά αυτό εθίγει λίγο από τους συνομιλητές πως το 2012 ξαφνικά βρεθήκαμε σε μια κατάσταση όπου ο, ο αρχέγονος φόβος της επιδημίας ε, οδήγησε σε μια σχετική έτσι, τύφλωση, θα έλεγα, θεσμούς και δημόσιους φορείς. Ε, είμαι βέβαιος ότι αυτό βέβαια δεν, ήταν, δεν είναι η ελληνική ιδιαιτερότητα, ότι έχει συμβεί στο παρελθόν σε άλλες χώρες και θα ξανασυμβεί. Ε, αλλά καλό είναι τα ουσιώδη και τα βασικά να τα θυμόμαστε πάνω. Λοιπόν, ε, παρακαλώ αν υπάρχει κάποια ερώτηση να λέτε απλώς το όνομά σας και την ιδιότητά σας. Και πώς ποιο είναι η ερώτηση. Ε, είναι ανοιχτό. Ε, Κώστας Φαρμακίδης, δικηγόρος. Εκ μέρου τη ομάδα δικηγόρων για τα δικαιώματα των προσφύγων και των μεταναστών. Καταρχήν, ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ τους, και του δύο ομιλητέ για την επιστημονικά εξαντλητική έτσι, παρουσίαση του θέματο. Ε, και είναι, το μόνο βέβαιο είναι ότι όλα αυτά είναι πάρα πολύ χρήσιμα για την, ε, για την Ελλάδα, που έχει ένα κενό και στην νομοθετική και στη δικαστηριακή πρακτική σε αυτά τα ζητήματα. Να τονίσω, για να τα ακούσω εγώ κυρίω ότι όλα αυτά, όλες αυτές οι προϋποθέσεις που θέτει η διοκτική υπηρεσία του στέματος είναι για να ασκηθεί δίωξη, όχι για την καταδίκη και αυτό για να γίνει μια σύγκριση με τα προηγούμενα που αναλύθηκαν στο πόσα, πόσες θετικές προϋποθέσεις χρειάζονται κατά την Αγγλική Διοκτική Υπηρεσία, για να ασκηθεί μία δίωξη, η οποία μπορεί και να μην φτάσει και σε καταδίκη. Εγώ θα ήθελα να κάνω μία πρόταση, δεν ξέρω κατά πόσο θα ήταν εφικτό, για να το εξετάσουν και οι διοργανωτές και οι άλλες οργανώσεις που ασχολούνται με το AIDS. Είναι εδώ και ο κύριος Γαλετσέλης, από ό,τι βλέπω, που είναι μέλος του Διοικητικού Συμβουλίου του Δικαιωρικού Συλλόγου, συντονιστής είναι Γενικός Γραμματέας του Υπουργείου Εσωτερικών. Εάν θα μπορούσαν οι κατευθυντήριες οδηγίες του UNH, που είναι εξαιρετικά χρήσιμες, θα έλεγα έτσι εγώ λόγω συμμετοχής στην υπηρετική παράδοση ως ενδιάμεση κανόνες εφαρμογής των ποινικών διατάξεων, αν θα μπορούσαν να αποτελέσουν κατόπιν αιτήματο των αρμοδίων ε, αντικείμενο μιας εγκυκλείου, μιας γνωμοδότησης του εισαγγελέα του Αριού Πάγου. Τους ε, ποινικού νόμους καλό είναι να μην τους πειράζουμε πολύ, καλό είναι να μην φτιάξουμε ειδικά αντικείμενα για το AIDS, να μην κάνουμε ερμηνείες ή παραγράφους 2 ή 3 ή 4, Εκτός δε αυτού αποτελεί και κυριαρχικό δικαίωμα το ποινικό δίκαιο του νομοθέτη που δεν μπορεί τέλος πάντων καθ' υπόδειξη πολλές φορές διεθνών οργανισμών ή επιστημονικών οργανώσεων να νομοθετεί, είναι στη δική του κρίση, αυτή είναι η παράδοση για το ποινικό μας δίκαιο. Θα μπορούσε όμως να υπάρξει μια εγκύκλειος ή μια γνωμοδότηση του Αγγελέα του Αρίου Πάγου που να λέει, έχουν υπάρξει αντίστοιχε για άλλα δικήματα, που να λέει ακριβώς 
αυτά τα πράγματα, ότι για να διωχθεί κάποιο λόγω προκλήσεως σωματικής βλάβης, λόγω μεταδόσεως HIV ή άλλου σεξουαλικού μεταδεδόμενου νοσήματος ή και ενδεχομένως δεν ξέρω πόσο νοσήματος εν γέννη, δεν ξέρω ε, πόσο θα μπορούσε, επιφυλάσσομαι για το πόσο θα μπορούσε να ανοίξει, χρειάζονται αυτές και αυτές οι θετικέ προϋποθέσεις. Θα φέρω έτσι ένα παράδειγμα, κλείνοντα. Ε, είναι σαν την υπόθεση, για παράδειγμα, των πλαστών χαρτονομισμάτων. Βγήκε μια εγκύκλωση των του εισαγγελέα του Αριού Πάγου, που είπε ότι όποιο βρεθεί με ένα πλαστό χαρτονόμισμα προφανώ δεν είναι παραχαράκτη και θα πρέπει η εισαγγελική αρχή να μην σπέβδει να τον διώκει. Αντιστοίχω υπάρχουν και σοβαρότερα θέματα, όπω είναι η παράνομη είσοδο μεταναστών σε σχέση με του αιτούντε άσυλο κλπ. Θα μπορούσαν οι διοργανωτέ και όλοι οι άλλοι εμπλεκόμενοι να το σκεφτούν. Ευχαριστώ. Ευχαριστούμε. Θα... Ε... Νομίζω καλύτερα να κάνουμε όλες τις ερωτήσεις και μετά να ε, υπάρχουν, ε, βλέπω πολλά χέρια να σηκώνονται. Ναι, να το πάω. Ευχαριστούμε για τις ε, πολύ καλές παρουσιάσεις. Ε, ήθελα να ρωτήσω και τους δύο ομιλητές, ε, με βάση την διακήρυξη του Οβιέδο για τα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα στην ε, διαιατρική, αν θεωρούν ότι οι προηγούμενες ε, περιπτώσεις ε, καταστρατηγούν το δικαίωμα της προστασίας της προσωπικής ζωής και της αυτονομίας του ατόμου. Και μια δεύτερη ερώτηση. Ε, αν θεωρούν ότι το HIV screening στο χώρο της πρωτοβάθμιας περίθαλψης θα βοηθήσει ή όχι. Ευχαριστώ. Και το, και το όνομά σας. Μαρία Χατζικυριάκου. Κάποια άλλη ερώτηση. Ναι. Ήθελα να ρωτήσω και στη συνέχεια τη παρέμβαση του κ. Φαρμακίδη ε, κατά πόσο υπάρχει αναλογία με αυτό που έκανε ε, οι διοικητικέ αρχέ του στέματο, με το πώ θα μπορούσε δηλαδή, αν υπάρχει κάτι αντίστοιχο το οποίο θα μπορούσαμε να, να, να κάνουμε εγώ, να κάνουμε εδώ πέρα. Ε, δεν είναι σίγουρο αυτό. Ρωτάω εσά του νομικού να μα πείτε αν υπάρχει κάτι αντίστοιχο. Είπατε για το τι θα μπορούσε να κάνει ο εισαγγελέα ίσως του Αριού Πάγου, αν θα υπήρχε κάποια άλλη διαδικασία που θα μπορούσαμε να ενεργοποιήσουμε. Φαγίσος Λέλλας, από θετική φωνή. Είναι περισσότερο σχόλιο αυτό που θα πω. Ευτυχώς βέβαια που οι εισαγγελείς δεν μπαίνουν τι αποφάσει του δικαστηρίου, γιατί κατά το νόμο είναι ορισμένοι απλά για να διώκουν και μάλιστα ίσως με τον πιο σκληρό τρόπο ανάλογα με το τι, ποιο νόμο χρησιμοποιούν και ποιες ενδείξεις ή αποδείξεις έχουν. Ε, Παρ' όλα αυτά είναι αξιέπαινη, θεωρώ, ότι η πρωτοβουλία του, της εισαγγελία του στέματος να περιορίσει τις διώξει. Βλέπουμε όμως ότι, βλέπω ότι το να φτάσω στο σημείο στη Βρετανία να, να ενάλλουν για περιπτώσει απλού έρπιτα ή πατήτηδες δηλώνει μια κοινωνία υποκαθεστώς πανικού και φοβερά συντηρητική, πολύ πιο συντηρητική από την Ελλάδα. Και θα ήθελα εδώ να το συνδέσω και να κάνω μια ερώτηση για το θέμα της ενσυνείδητης αμέλειας. Δηλαδή, η ενσυνείδητη αμέλεια ισχύει σαν ένδειξη για δίωξη ενός ανθρώπου που μετέδωσε σε κάποιον άλλον και δεν ισχύει για τον άλλον ο οποίο με δική του ασυνείδητη αμέλεια συνένεσε στο να κάνει σεξ με κάποιον του οποίου το έτσι ο διστάτος δεν γνώριζε. Αυτή, αν, αν αυτό ισχύει α, μόνο για τον α, εναγόμενο σαν στοιχείο εναντίον του και όχι για τον εναγόντα που βλάφθηκε από την ασυνείδητη αμέλεια του εναγόμενου όμω και όχι τη δική του, τότε, κατά τη γνώμη μου, προάγουμε μια κοινωνία ανεύθυνων ανθρώπων για τον εαυτό τους, ανεύθυνων να ορίσουν τον εαυτό τους και το, όπως υπόθηκε και μια άλλη χαρακτηριστικότητα, λέξη που θυμάμαι, και που ζητούν μετά, αφού βλάφθηκαν από την ανευθυνότητά τους, ζητούν μετά τα ρέστα και δικαιοσύνη για κάτι για το οποίο φέρουν εξίσου μεγάλη ευθύνη και οι ίδιοι. Και έρχεται η δικαιοσύνη του κράτους να την αποδώσει για να δηλώσει τι. Ότι μόνο η μία πλευρά είναι υπεύθυνη. Αυτή η συνείδητη αμέλεια 
δεν έχει πολλά κενά για μένα και για το, σε ποιο θα τους δεν ισχύει. Μία ακόμα ερώτηση έχουμε. Α, όχι ποιος. Α, συγγνώμη. Μάλιστα. Λοιπόν, θα δώσω αμέσως το λόγο στους μιλητές. Θέλω να πω μόνο ότι ε, με προλάβατε, διότι αυτό, δεν θέλω να προκαταλάβω εγώ την κουβέντα, εγώ απλώς συντονίζω, αλλά αυτό που πραγματικά ε, είναι στο μυαλό μου, ακούγοντας και την παρουσίασή σας, ε, είναι ότι τίνουμε συχνά να αντιμετωπίζουμε τους ε, πολίτες, δηλαδή με μια υπερπροστατευτικότητα υπερ, υπερ και με ένα υποτοκράτος μιας έτσι, ενός πατερναλισμού ε, ε, λες και ε, οι έννοιες της ανηλικότητας και της ενηλικότητας δεν έχουν ε, ε, κάποια σημασία. Δηλαδή, πώς να το πω, ε, υπάρχει ένα σοβαρό ζήτημα ε, γιατί ποιος μπορεί τη σήμερα ημέρα να πει ότι δεν είναι πληροφορημένος για το τι είναι το HIV. Ε, και είναι και λίγο αντιφατικό ε, αυτό το οποίο κάνουμε προκειμένου. Δηλαδή, ή είναι κάτι σοβαρό και επικίνδυνο ή δεν είναι κάτι σοβαρό και επικίνδυνο ε, με βάση και τα στοιχεία τα οποία έχουμε από, την, ε, από τα ιατρικά δεδομένα και τις έρευνες. Αν δεν είναι και είναι τόσο, τόσο πολύ απλό, ας πούμε, ότι εντάξει, τότε γιατί να διώκουμε κιόλα. Εάν είναι... Ε, Πάλι εκεί η πληρο... λείπει άργη η πληροφόρηση είναι αυτό που λένε ότι μας λείπει η πληροφόρηση για το κακό που κάνουν τα ναρκωτικά. Ποιο δεν ξέρει ας πούμε, τι κάνουν ή δεν κάνουν τα ναρκωτικά. Ας πούμε. Το λέω αυτό γιατί είναι ένα... θέλετε μια πολύ σημαντική παράμετρο του προβλήματος. Αλλά δεν θέλω εγώ να μιλήσω για αυτά. Προτιμώ να μιλήσετε εσείς. Οπότε... Ε... Ναι. Ελάτε, ελάτε κύριε Καλτσέλη. Θα σας δώσω ένα λεπτό. Ε, Λέγω Μεγαλετσέλης Παναγιώτης ε, και είμαι μέλος του Διοικητικού Συμβουλίου του Δικαιολογού Συλλόγου Αθήνας. Ε, έχω... Πρώτα πρώτα θέλω να ευχαριστήσω τους ομιλητές οι οποίοι ήταν εμπεριστατωμένοι στις διατυπώσεις των νομικών των απόψεων. Ήδη αυτό το θέμα, ο ψήμος, πριν από τρει-τέσσερι μήνες αν θυμούμε καλώς, απεσχόλησε την ελληνική κοινωνία και μάλιστα με διαπομπεύσεις προσώπων τα οποία κατά την ταπεινή μου άποψη δεν είχαν δικαίωμα οι δημόσιες αρχές να διαπομπεύσουν. Ε, Προέβαινε σε μια ενέργεια ε, την οποία... Άποψη αυτή για να προβώσει ενέργεια, για να είμαι ειλικρινής, μου την έριξε ο φίλτατος ο Δημήτρης Φαρμακήρης, πατέρας του νεαρού που μίλησε προηγουμένως. Αναγκάστηκα με την ιδιότητα του Συμβούλου να κάνω μία αίτηση στο Δικηγορικό Σύλλογο Αθήνας, δηλαδή στο Διοικητικό Συμβούλιο, προκειμένου να συζητήσουμε λεπτομερώς το όλο θέμα και να πάρουμε ως είχαμε υποχρέωση να πάρουμε μία θέση στα τεκτενόμενα αυτά που σας προείπα για να μην κουράζω. Ε, το Διοικητικό Συμβούλιο μάλλον για να είμαι ειλικρινής όχι, το Διοικητικό Συμβούλιο Πρόεδρος Έκρινε ότι το θέμα είναι εχμηρό, ότι δεν υπάρχουν όρια και κατά συνέπεια δεν το συζήτησε ή δεν το εισήγαγε στο ΔΣ προκειμένου να συζητηθεί και να πάρουμε θέσεις. Αναγκάστηκα λοιπόν ύστερα από όλα αυτά να δημοσιεύσω στο νομικό περιοδικό το οποίο εκδίδει ο εκδοτικός σήκος Καρατζάς, ένα άρθρο μου, το οποίο άρθρο βασικά είναι διαπλουτισμένο σε σχέση με την αίτηση που είχα καταθέσει στο Διοικητικό Συμβούλιο, το οποίο τιτλοφορείται «Τεκμήριο αθωότητας, προστασία προσωπικότητας και των προσωπικών δεδομένων 
σε σχέση με τη δημοσίευση φωτογραφιών εκδιδομένων γυναικών φορέως, φορέων του ΕΕΤΣ. Ε, νομίζω ότι εγώ του αισθήν εκτιμώ ύστερα από την σημερινή ή ύστερα από το σημερινό άκουσμα των εξαίρετων ομιλητών ότι επιβάλλεται να τον ξαναφέρω πάλι στο Διοικητικό Συμβούλιο ενδεχομένως εμπλουτίζοντάς τον με όσο υλικό υπάρχει και μπορώ τουλάχιστον να το χρησιμοποιήσω. Θα θέλω να εγχειρήσω δύο φωτοτυπίες της αρθρογραφίας αυτής γιατί νομίζω ότι λίγο πολύ κινείται στα πλαίσια τα οποία ανέπτυξαν οι ομιλητές Βεβαίω είναι στα ελληνικά αν μπορούν να τα διαβάσουν και να τα συνεκτιμήσουν σε σχέση με όλα αυτά τα οποία υπόθηκαν εδώ πέρα. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ε, ευχαριστούμε και εμείς. Και να, και να πω απλώς ότι... Και επίσης θέλω να σε ενημερώσω ένα άλλο, το οποίο είναι μόλις σε άλλο. Ε, θέλω να σας πληροφορήσω ότι το άρθρο αυτό μου το ζήτησε και ο Υπουργός Δικαιοσύνης, ο σημερινός Υπουργός Δικαιοσύνης, ο οποίος από την διαβεβαίωση προωθεί νόμο στη Βουλή. Κατά πόσον θα έρθει νόμος ή όχι, σχέδιο δηλαδή, ε, δεν το ξέρω. Αλλά, αν πάση πτώση, ε, έχει χειριστεί στα χέρια του και μου είπε ότι θα αποτελέσει τουλάχιστον ένα υλικό για την νόμο παρασκευαστική επιτροπή του Υπουργείου Δικαιοσύνη στην Αρμοδία. Ευχαριστούμε. Μάλιστα. Ευχαριστούμε και εμείς τώρα. Αναγκάζομαι και εγώ να πω μια κουβέντα σχετική. Ε, όπως ε, ίσως ξέρετε, ε, ήμουν εκείνος που ε, έστειλα το θέμα στην αρχή προστασίας προσωπικών δεδομένων. Δηλαδή, όταν ήμουν στο Υπουργείο Δικαιοσύνης, επειδή δεν μπορεί κανείς ε, και δει γενικό γραμματέας να απευθυνθεί όταν μια υπόθεση συγκεκριμένη είναι σε εξέλιξη, θα δημιουργούσε άλλου τύπου ζητήματα να απευθυνθεί απευθείας προς τη δικαιοσύνη. Εκείνο το οποίο αποφάσισα, και καταφέραμε τέλο πάντων και συνοηθήκαμε εκεί στο Υπουργείο, είναι να σταλεί το θέμα στην αρχή προς τις προσωπικών δεδομένων, όχι με την έννοια του πώς χειρίστηκε οι εισαγγελικές αρχές τις συγκεκριμένες υποθέσεις, αλλά... Πρώτον, όσον αφορά το ζήτημα ε, το γενικότερο, δηλαδή εάν υπάρχει κάποιο τύπου νομοθετικό κενό ή είναι περιβολικά ευρία η διάταξη του νόμου που επιτρέπει την παραβίαση προσωπικών δεδομένων. Και δεύτερον, όσον αφορά την ανάρτηση των στοιχείων αυτών, ε, δηλαδή είναι άλλο το να έρεται εν την ημέτρο η προστασία των προσωπικών δεδομένων, άλλο το να αποκαλύπτεται ένα όνομα και άλλο το να βγαίνει στον τύπο, άλλο το να βγαίνουν εικόνες, άλλο το να βγαίνει στο δημόσιο χώρο με αυτόν τον τρόπο και στις άλλες υπάρχει και ένα ζήτημα μέχρι πότε. Δηλαδή, βδομάδες, μήνες μετά, αυτές οι εικόνες ήταν ακόμα στο site της ελληνικής αστυνομία. Και υπήρξε η γνωμοδότητα της αρχής προστασίας προσωπικών δεδομένων, η οποία είναι ίσως όχι το, όσο τολμηρή θα ήθελαν κάποιοι, αλλά πάντως είναι ήδη ένα ξεκίνημα που δίνει και ένα έναυσμα για την νομοθετική πρωτοβουλία. Καλύπτει το ζήτημα βέβαια της προστασίας προσωπικών δεδομένων, όχι της άσκησης δίωξης. Ε, λοιπόν, ε, beauty before age. Ε, <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying to um, answer some of the questions. I'm not sure that everything was um, translated perhaps entirely as it may have been meant. Um, perhaps if I can deal with the issue of, of recklessness first, because um, that's, that's something specific that I think was about our policy. Um, I think the question was about if people cannot be um, trusted to protect themselves, 
is it appropriate for the criminal law to intervene and judge one person reckless when the other person isn't being judged? Is that correct? For both sides. Yes. Yeah. Not only for, for the one that transmits, but also for the other yeah. that uh, exposes himself to transmission. Yeah. The, the question is knowledge. That's the, that's the question that we look at when we look at the reasonableness of the behaviour of the individuals. So we would look at where someone has knowledge of their partner's condition and consents to a sexual activity, we wouldn't prosecute in those circumstances if, they, if the, the infection was transmitted. It's a defence. If the person, if the individual who is the victim um, is, is, has knowledge of the defendant's condition prior to having sexual activity with that individual and then becomes infected, it would be unlikely that a prosecution could ever be successful on that basis in the UK, in, in England. Sorry to you. He said he, that he has knowledge of the risk. Well, do they? I think that's the point. You'd have to look at the factual circumstances of every case to decide whether that was the case or not. Um, just because someone consents to sexual activity doesn't mean they consent to the risk of transmission of an infection. And you have factual circumstances such as we've had cases where individuals have held themselves out to be HIV negative when in fact they're HIV positive. There is clearly a, there a deception on the part of the individual and that has played on the mind of the individual who then consents to the activity and that we say is unreasonable. Is the information of the HIV status for, on, for, on the side of the defendant uh, mandatory? It's part of the consideration that we'd apply. If that individual was on a process of treatment and they had not disclosed their status but they were following treatment and they're, they're, they were doing what their doctors had told them to do in terms of treatment paths and so on, then again, whether they acted reasonably by not disclosing and having sex would be a consideration that we would apply. So it's, it's a question of what's reasonable in, in all of the circumstances. So you have to look at, you can't just say, is it reckless or isn't it? Looking at the facts, the medical evidence supports the transmission, but the facts are those, that's the basis on which we would draw from to look at whether something was reasonable and therefore reckless or not. Um, everyone we accept has a duty individually, a, more, a, a duty to, to protect themselves and to conduct themselves in an appropriate way. But what we, what we do in, in, in terms of the, in, the law in England and Wales is when we apply the criminal law, we have to look at the circumstances of the particular transmission and whether the acts of the individuals were reasonable in all the circumstances. And if, they, if we deem that they weren't in terms of the criminal law, then that's when a prosecution would result. But where someone where a victim has knowledge of a defendant's status or where um, a victim is, um, uh, is told information which should give them an implied knowledge of a defendant's status, then it would be very unlikely that prosecution would result in those circumstances. Well, you have to consider that many times even the victim is not in the mental state to mm. ask for information. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can talk later if you like. <laughs> um, and I think someone else, I mean, it's a question of exposing someone to a risk, I think, and that, that's the issue. It's, it's whether the risk, exposing that individual to the risk was reasonable in all the circumstances. And what the individual may have known about that risk is, a, is an important factor in considering whether the behaviours were reasonable. So if a victim knew something about the risk and exposed himself to it, then yes, they have a responsibility. We all have a responsibility in that way. Um, I don't know if I can explain it any more clear, but I think there was a question earlier on about um, prosecuting, um, I don't know, but something to do with cases. It was the lady over there, and I don't know, I don't think we had that translated to us entirely, um, so I'm not sure what the question was. Um, in, it was in relation to medical evidence yeah. undermining. In the, in the of, of Viedo, uh... Sorry. in the framework of Oviedo Convention about human rights and private uh, life yes. and uh, individual autonomy. Yes. Are these cases support or are against uh, uh, the protection of private life? They're very much in, 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 in line with those, those policies, very much in line with human rights. We would never 
be able to access someone's medical records without their consent. We don't, we cannot get the medical re records of, of an individual without their consent. That applies to both the victim and the defendant. So if we have a case where um, a defendant is refusing access to the medical records, then we would have to go through a court process to get access to those documents. And a court would decide whether that was the, in the public interest to have the documents um, as, as counteracted against the individual rights of the individual themselves. So that, that's where we would get into that um, discussion. Um, we, as a prosecuting authority, couldn't have access to that material because, not least, because the medical professionals wouldn't give us it because they would act in the interests of non-disclosure. Um, in terms of the public at large, there are um, the, the Crown Prosecution in England and Wales would not have. I don't want to go into the case that happened in May because that that's something specific um, to you, but. By comparison, in England and Wales, we would not, as a public, public prosecuting authority, have put those details into the public domain. So that information about names, pictures, dates of birth and all of that information would not be something that the CPS would release to the media. We have strict rules about what we're allowed to broadcast, what we're allowed to publicise, how we act with people's personal data. We've we have restricted rules about what we do with our own data and um, we would have to go through a process of agreeing and having some sort of judici judicial authority o overarching that before things like that would be released. Sometimes I think an example was given of someone who had escaped from custody um, and that that individual's details were um, put into the media and that happens in, in the UK but again there is a process that we go through in order to release that information we would have to be satisfied that that was in the public interest that the information was out in the public domain and in these types of cases it's, it's very difficult uh, certainly my opinion is it would be very difficult in these cases to justify that I hope that helps I hope that answers the question thank you I think for me, really, uh, my reaction will be about uh, how we go from here on this particular issue. Uh, I think a number of the points that were made, particularly um, by the gentleman from the Bar Association, is points in the direction of having a conversation within uh, a number of professional bodies that are close to the issue. Um, the, to take an example that is concrete, in the United States, the American Bar Association has played a good role in moving this discussion forward. Uh, first, by convening uh, a day of dialogue around the issue, then by developing a set of, of elements for consideration. And then last week, uh, on the 1st of December, on the International AIDS Day, what they did was to look into the report of the Global Commission on HIV and the law and see how they are moving forward in the United States on this particular issue related to the criminalization of HIV transmission. So what you said about continuing such dialogue within the Bar Association is particularly relevant. I hope that as you try to push forward, you will get the support from the health, but also from the HIV community joining in pushing for that, and that you will ensure the involvement of organization of people living with HIV. Positive voices must be heard uh, in, 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 in that dialogue, and really this is what we see as the way forward. But it shouldn't be something that is only uh, done within the Bar Association, is such dialogue also has to take place with the police. Uh, we are very pleased that the Secretary General of the Ministry of Interior is here, and that as you move forward... I'm not responsible for the police. The oh, Ministry okay. of Interior is not responsible for the police in Greece. It's Ministry oh, okay. of, of Public Order. Oh, okay. Okay, that's interesting to know, but at least, you know, in your capacity, maybe within your ministry, further moving this discussion, that if within the judiciary, such dialogue takes place involving all stakeholders, and we will be very much pleased if UNAID's guidance were to be used in, in this process. As I said earlier, we are working toward finer, a more elaborated guidance that we discuss the scientific issues, but also the legal principles, and if you want to use that as you move forward, we will avail it to you. As soon as it is ready, we will ensure that you have access to it and that you can use it as you continue discussing uh, these complicated but also challenging but also important issues 
uh, around which we hope that you will apply the best available evidence and the legal principle that should inform any use of the criminal law. Λοιπόν, ευχαριστούμε πολύ όλους σας. Ε, με, με αυτή τη θετική φωνή έτσι, προς το τέλος, νομίζω κλείσαμε ωραία και εύχομαι καλή επιτυχία και στην αυριανή σας έτσι, συνεδρία.